right, well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have created us after your own image. We thank you for uh, the reminder and our confession and the singing of the folly of idolatry and trying to make you after our own image or after the image of gold and silver and other uh, forms of the creation. Uh, we think of the foolishness in Isaiah's day and, and how they were making these things and calling it good and the very reversal of creation, how you declared male and female after your own image to be good. And we thank you that you have made us to know you, and we pray now for the work of your Spirit, uh, as we know that it is only through the recreative work of the Holy Spirit that we can have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. We pray that you would reveal those things in our own lives and the life of our household or congregation in which we are trusting in anyone or anything less than you. We pray that we would uh, put off any form of idolatry, and we pray that you would help us to put on the mind of Christ as uh, we are being remade after his image and knowledge and righteousness and holiness of the truth. So we pray for the coming of your kingdom. We pray for your name, that it would be hallowed, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we uh, continue our study in Isaiah, and I, we looked at Isaiah chapter 41 this last Lord's Day, and um, the title of the sermon uh, comes from Isaiah chapter 41, uh, Do Not Fear You Blank Jacob. Uh, what's Jacob being called in Isaiah chapter 41? A worm. So do not uh, fear you worm Jacob. Why um, call it Jacob the worm or a worm? Yes, uh, so uh, a worm is helpless and vulnerable. Um, and very uh, interestingly, uh, most humorously, uh, we see what this worm would do in exile. So right after he's called a, a worm, um, we learn that the, the worm Jacob uh, um, would um, have teeth. He would thresh the mountains and crush them. He would make the hills like chaff in verse 15. Um, we also learned in Isaiah that exile becomes a, a metaphor, not just for God's discipline and punishment, but a, a metaphor for what else? Yes, missions. So we are entering into the, one of the great missionary sections of uh, the Old Testament scriptures, uh, Babylon. And uh, we looked at on the Lord's Day that the, the exile was one of the great, if not perhaps the greatest evangelistic period a 70-year period uh, in Old Covenant history. Uh, we also looked at the, uh, the word for myrtle as an example of um, the prosperity. Remember the Hebrew word for myrtle? Uh, Hadass, right? And um, who is named Hadassah? It would be uh, Esther. And uh, so it seems that God's people, as they looked in, of course, uh, men like Daniel would have been studying these prophecies, and Daniel and I are studying the prophecy of um, Jeremiah, and uh, naming their children uh, based on uh, the the hope of uh, the return from exile, and the the hope that they would in, in some way be used um, as a, a blessing to the nations. So, two of the most famous books during the time of the exile would be Daniel and Esther. And both, you know, the, those individuals were orphaned. Um, Esther was raised by her cousin Mordecai uh, and taken into uh, the, the harem of King Artaxerxes. Uh, God greatly used that. Um, the same thing for Daniel and his uh, three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they were, again, uh, separated from the Promised Land, their family, given a new education, new names, and, and yet they were used in a mighty way in the courts of Babylon, um, even to the point of the, the courts of the Persians, um, and, and perhaps even one of the reasons why Cyrus then would declare a return from exile. It could have been the influence of somebody like a, a Daniel and uh, his service. And you have other Jews uh, serving in the courts like Nehemiah, whose, whose name is means comfort, and it goes back to the comfort of Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, we also looked at the, the strength in this passage, 
and uh, being a worm and helpless and thrown into furnaces and being thrown into lion's dens, um, being taken into a, a pagan king's harem. Um, it might seem like the worst thing that could happen, um, but in God's providence and unsearchable wisdom, uh, it was the best thing for God's people and for the salvation of the world. And that's the context of verse 10. Fear not, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So I'd like to look a little bit more in Isaiah chapter 41 in this idea of exile, uh, because exile is the last thing in the world that any of us would choose for ourselves, um, and, and yet God can use this sovereignly um, at, for the purposes of uh, a new creation. And so uh, the wilderness, I'd like to look at uh, some of the trees uh, that Isaiah discusses. I seems uh, like Isaiah was a gardener or a botanist. Uh, we'll look at a lot, lot of imagery. And of course, the, the imagery goes to uh, the work of uh, the Christ and, and the Holy Spirit. So these are images of the Holy Spirit, but they're descriptions of us in the worst of circumstances. But do you have any questions or comments about uh, the worm Jacob and uh, not fearing? As uh, I'd like to look at uh, verses uh, 17 through 20 after this, but any qu questions about the sermon? Anything you've been thinking about? So one of the ways we can think about praying as we, we do go through in times like the valley of the shadow of death and, and scary uh, dark times that n n we can pray, of course, God deliver us, uh, but God use this for the deliverance of others and and so think about you know it's not that uh, we're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, but it, when we are thrown into the, whatever fiery furnace it, it might be in, in our own circumstances like that's cross-bearing uh, it's it's yes God save me but God save others through this uh, demonstrate your your power and your glory it's a it's a so exile is a very different way. It's not just get me out of this. It's, it's use this, God. Be, he is sovereign, and this is what he does. He brings his people into the wilderness, and he, he saves other people through that, showing our own weakness, but showing the power of his, his right hand uh, to save. Uh, he does the same thing in our generation. So yes, God, save me, preserve me, uh, but preserve others who are, are dead in their transgressions and sins. All right, if there are no uh, comments or questions, I'd like to read from Isaiah 41 and verses 17 through 20. And what I'd like to look at uh, this evening is uh, this, uh, these themes, these metaphors. Now, of course, the wilderness is a literal place, uh, but it, uh, the wilderness and the desert is also a, a metaphor. And it is going to be a metaphor uh, for missions, uh, the good news of the gospel. It will be a, a metaphor for the revelation of God's glory to the nations. What God is going to, to do, uh, Isaiah is revealing, and, uh, with Jacob's uh, exile would be something uh, remarkable. And uh, it's, it's like a, a paradise uh, in the mil middle of the wilderness. So Isaiah, it is revealed to him in verse 17, that the afflicted and needy are seeking water, but there is none. And their tongue is parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself as the God of Israel. I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. I will put the cedar in the wilderness, the acacia and the myrtle and the olive tree. I will place the juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well, that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. So what, what God is revealing to, to Isaiah and what we'll be looking at uh, this evening is it will be remarkable because God is telling about the exile. So he, and that, that's what verses 21 and following will be about. So we'll look at that, Lord willing, next time. Um, so God is going to uh, reveal the future exile of his people, what he's going to do. And he will even reveal the name of the king 
who will pronounce the return from exile, and that'll come at the end of Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45. And, and again, uh, in verse, t and the second thing here in verse 20, um, that notice that they may see, recognize, consider, gain insight. So you're, you're to look at these things, and it's not just the Israelites, the, the descendants of Jacob, that are to watch what God is doing through this exile. Um, it's the, the nations as well. So I'd like to look at, um, again, the, this idea of wilderness, uh, desert. Uh, these are images of the, of the the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit. These are images of a new creation. Uh, verse 20 ends uh, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. That's the word barat. It's used only for God. He is the one who creates anything that we make as in an original creation like God's. It's uh, maybe a replica or an imitation of what he does. But this is the language of Genesis chapter 1, uh, the creation of the heavens and the earth. And in some way, there's going to be a, a creative or a recreative act in the, the, the wilderness um, from the dust of the earth again, but it's going to be from even the dust of judgment and, and exile and punishment, and, and he will bring about a, a new work. Uh, so we'll be, uh, we'll be looking also at uh, biblical botany. So any, uh, uh, any questions as we move on to looking at uh, the wilderness and what God is doing in the wilderness in this exile? Because you can begin to think, what's God doing in my life? Beca and, I, and that's another, th as we apply this to ourselves, the way the scriptures speak of the, the New Covenant Church, we are strangers, we are aliens, we are in exile. So th this is, so the, the world, in other words, isn't our home. Uh, the, the, uh, we are pilgrims and strangers. And so we need to be thinking of ourselves as being in exile. Um, that's how Peter, will look at, I think, First Peter chapter 1, speaks to the church as the diaspora, those who are, are scattered, those who are, are aliens. So we'll never quite find our, our place here uh, in this present age, or at least we shouldn't. All right, so again, as you look at these verses, you, you see the emphasis in, on the wilderness in verse 19 and what God will do. So here's a, a re, we might say a recreative act of God. Um, I will make the wilderness a pool of water. So this is something that uh, we cannot do. Uh, this is something that God is doing. And he's not just talking, God's not uh, talking about a, a physical change in the desert. Um, he, he's talking about the, the desert that was caused by the sin of our first parents. I will put the cedar in the wilderness. And in you notice all of these other trees as well, the acacia, the myrtle, the olive tree, the juniper, and the desert together with the box tree and the, the cypress. Now, as we, we think, what does the wilderness represent? Um, to us today in the 21st century, uh, the wilderness can mean something different than what it meant in the Bible. For us, the idea of wilderness might mean, you know, I just want to get away from it all. Um, those of you who are in high school or college, uh, or, you know, you may remember being assigned to read like uh, Emerson or Thoreau, and this idea of getting back to nature, uh, getting back to the wilderness is, you know, returning to reason and faith. Um, getting back to pristine and untouched nature. Uh, sometimes we might talk about going to the wilderness uh, as a, a vacation. That is not the meaning of wilderness in, in the scriptures. So you have to, you don't want to confuse that. So, so sometimes when I think of the wilderness, I, I think of, oh, that's a great place. There, uh, <clears throat> there's a place that we go to on, on Lake George, and um, somebody bequeathed land across the lake, and you can't step on it. It's pristine. Uh, I forget, it's like forever forest or something like that. And it will always remain uh, untouched wilderness. And so you think, oh, it's, it's, and it's wonderful to go out to the point on the water and just to sit there. Uh, there's a gazebo, and, and you can just look at <laughs> the wilderness. Um, that's, again, that's, that's, not, that's not the scriptural idea of the wilderness. Uh, you, you, to biblically understand the, the idea of wilderness, wilderness, think of being taken away from your family into captivity. That's wilderness. So your children, uh, and this happens in Islamic countries, your, your, your daughters are kidnapped, and they, they marry off into a Muslim man or something like that. 
that's the wilderness. Um, a loved one uh, dying um, or who has died, that's uh, a, a wilderness. So th in the Bible, the wilderness and what we're reading here in Isaiah chapter 41, it's not a place that is naturally conducive to, to life or uh, relaxation or rest. The wilderness is a place where you don't have any personal or natural resources, and it's a metaphor for a place that only God can sustain a person physically and spiritually. So there could be wildernesses today like a secular university. Now, a secular university might have everything conducive to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, but it doesn't have anything that's conducive or very little. Maybe you'll find another Christian witness and light, but very little that's conducive to one's spiritual growth. Uh, your workplace could be a, a type of a wilderness. An unhappy marriage or the death of a spouse could be a, a wilderness. Singleness, isolation, loneliness can be uh, a wilderness. Children who aren't following the Lord would be a, a wilderness for godly parents. Um, so there, th this, is, this, this is the idea of the, the exile. You are going to be Isaiah, it's being revealed to Isaiah that Judah is going to be far away from the promised land, far away from Jerusalem, um, and uh, you're, you're going to be faced with this question, you know, is God my resource for life? Will I trust in him and his word? Uh, this is, of course, a, a major theme in the scriptures, going back to Adam and Eve being exiled from the garden. Uh, it's a major theme of the exodus and, and entering into the promised land. Uh, it's one of the first things and places that Jesus was taken to after he was uh, baptized in the river Jordan and the Spirit of God came upon him and the Spirit then impels or drives Jesus into the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And the, the first of the temptations in that wilderness for, for Jesus in Matthew's Gospel uh, was if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And um, that, that was a temptation. That was a test. That was the same test, you, you know, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And, and Jesus makes clear um, that the, the life, uh, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So is, is God enough? Is his word enough to live in the wilderness of Babylon and exile. And the fact is, like we've learned already, the Israelites didn't have anything else. So if, if you begin to rely on resources outside of God's word, um, you're kind of buying into the, uh, the, the demonic philosophy of the wilderness and that God isn't sufficient and uh, you need to kind of find your, your own way for uh, in life. And um, and um, that was something that Hezekiah struggled with at the end of uh, Genesis 39, or I'm sorry, Isaiah 39. Um, the Babylonians come to, to Hezekiah, and Hezekiah doesn't give glory to God. You know, it's like they go home with sand. They go home with nothing. And, and God says, <laughs> all your treasures are going to Babylon. And, and now the comfort of Isaiah 40 is, in 41, and these, now this, this section of Isaiah is um, it, th that, you, my people, my remnant, are going to be going to Babylon, and, and my glory is going to be uh, displayed there in the wilderness. And all you will have is me. All you have is my word. But all is a, an encouraging thing. It's not like, oh, that's all I have. That's, what else do you need? Right? Because God is with, uh, with us. God is Emmanuel. And that's the, the strengthening, that's the comfort of this passage. And that's uh, what we need as uh, God's people um, and as a reminder. Um, all right, so uh, uh, this is a, a theme that we've been, you know, touching upon throughout Isaiah. Um, Isaiah 40 begins with this call in the wilderness, and so do that the Gospels. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth the desert, in the desert, a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So that God is going to, so this is, this is now this is taking us a little bit even beyond Babylon, but Babylon would serve this purpose 
Um, but it's not just the flesh of Jacob. It's not just the descendants of Jacob who would see the glory of the Lord. It's all flesh will see the glory of the Lord. And, and, and it will be in the, the harshest of circumstances. It will be from the, uh, the death, the dust of the earth. So, so, so th think of the glory of the Lord here in verse 5 of Isaiah 40. And notice in verse 20 of Isaiah 41 that they may see and recognize so that God is going to be doing something in this exile, this place of, of death and forsakenness, so that they, and it's not, again, it's, it's both Jews and Gentiles, that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this. And this happens when people are saved, doesn't it? You know, if, if uh, you know, people look and, and they say, what has God done in this life? It's, it's like, here is a person who uh, had nothing to do with God, and all of a sudden they're made a new creature in Christ. That's, that's like something, a, a life, a tree in the wilderness is, <coughs> we'll be looking <coughs> at. This is why we're the salt of the earth and, and the light of the world. Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah will continue talking about the wilderness. Uh, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on them, let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. The settlements where Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. And again, that's how Isaiah 41 is begin with the coastlands, but now it's it's, it's, there's a work of God, and uh, even the wilderness uh, will be uh, fruitful, fruitful to the praise and the glory of God. Um, we see this in Isaiah chapter 43, this, this wilderness, this, this desert. Uh, Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. Um, in Isaiah 51, um, the Lord says, and as, here's comfort to Zion again in verse 3. Uh, Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and her wilderness he will make like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and sound of a melody. So here's this fallen and sin-cursed world, and God is going to make uh, an Eden out of this, this wilderness. Um, <clears throat> so any comments or questions so far um, about wilderness? And I'd like to look at some of the, the trees as we've been, uh, we started to look at in the Lord's day. Um, I forgot to change these slides here. Oh, oh wait, oh, maybe I didn't. Let me just, maybe I didn't forget. Okay, so on this last um, Lord's Day, not everyone saw this, so I, I showed this for our Sabbath school. Um, so in verse 19, so I'd like to look at the biblical botany in the wilderness, and uh, the Lord says, I will put the cedar in the wilderness. And one of the things about um, in well, even today in, in places, deserts, um, when you see, like, life in the middle of n nothing, um, it, Maggie, could you get the uh, plug, the battery's low on this, and uh, it's going to shut down on me in a second. Um, so here is a, a cedar. So this is, um, going back to verse 19, this is one of the, the pictures I showed in Sabbath school, but since not everyone is there to see it, um, and I didn't include it in the recording, uh, I just wanted to talk about it again. So here's a, a tree, a cedar in the wilderness. Uh, this is the, the Teneri tree, and it was a, a solitary, oh, I'm sorry, it was an acacia, um, not the cedar. Um, but it was once considered the most isolated tree on the earth, and they're within a radius of 250 miles. So imagine that you're in the, the Sahara Desert, and you're walking along, and there's, there's like no, no life. 
and there's this tree, and it is a, a lone tree. It is a, a sight to behold. And again, this idea of this sight to behold, this is what the Lord is saying that he's going to do with his people. Um, you, you have uh, in verse 20 that they may see and know. So God is going to be placing his people. He's using the imagery of trees. Uh, there are actually seven trees in verse 19 that are, are mentioned. And, and when you see a tree like this in the middle of nowhere, it, it arouses your uh, attention, your wonder, and your awe. And this is what the Lord is saying that he's going to be doing in his salvation. So, uh, and you can read about the Teneri tree on Wikipedia. I'll be quoting from it uh, here. But there's one man who saw the Teneri tree in, in 1939. And, and again, think of what God is saying people would see, say about his salvation. One man seeing this tree uh, said, one must see this tree, the Teneri tree, to believe its existence. Was it secret? How can it be living in spite of the multitudes of camels which trample at its sides? How uh, does not a lost camel eat its th leaves and thorns? Why don't the numerous uh, caravans um, cut its branches to make fire, to, to brew their tea? The only answer, <laughs> um, he goes on, you know, is, is to say, you know, this is like to him some kind of, of miracle. And um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, uh, 1973, a drunk driver hit it and killed it. And, uh, but it was such a wonder that it was put, at th it's, a, it's in a museum today. The, they actually put that Teneri uh, tree in a museum, and uh, there's now a, a monument uh, that looks like the Teneri tree uh, on, on that spot. And, and this is what God is saying through Isaiah, and this is, but it's, it's going to be his people. So that it's, it's, it's he, God's pe people will be the, 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 the image of his glory. So it's not that we're going to make idols of gold and silver lo that look like God and say, oh, look, there's God's glory. God made us in his image, and as image bearers, he is saying that he is going to work, and the work of the Spirit will be such as that other people will see the glory of God in the new life and the work of the Spirit upon them. God's glory would be seen in a wonderful way, you know, in uh, young men like Daniel or young women like Esther in, in ways that you would never imagine. But that, that is the way in which God's redemptive glory is going to be revealed. You are, in other words, and Jesus will, will teach the same thing, but you're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Th this is how um, men will know um, by your love for one another. That, that is the apologetic. And so this is a, a, the glory that is being revealed is the glory of Christ's finished work, and it's the glory of the Holy Spirit. So just as uh, trees, and here, again, here the acacia tree here, the tenere tree, uh, it was a sight to behold. And, and God is saying that this is what his people are. This is how we are to be looking. Now, we're trusting in God's word because you don't always know. You're like, how is God going to make any sense out of this life? You, we leave that to him. What we need to do is, is trust in the Lord. You know, that's what Ahaz did not do. He didn't trust in the Lord. And so the glory of the Lord, unfortunately, wasn't revealed to Tiglath-Pileser as it ought to have been. Uh, God healed Hezekiah miraculously, uh, but he didn't give glory to the Lord when the Babylonians came. And this is, as we think about our lives, it's right the chief end of man, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So you, you look at our lowliness, our wormliness, right? And you say, God, how are you going? To, I, don't, I don't know. But the question uh, for us is, can you be saying, God, here I am, send me. I, I want to be your man, your woman, um, that, that you use uh, to make known your glory. Whatever it co the cost, you know, if it's throwing me into a fiery furnace, that's fine. And I'm not saying that I'm choosing that, but whatever God chooses for us, to, where to plant us or to place us, God, I will serve you there or here, right? So we're already planted, but this is where he has called us. This is Babylon, Th this, the, the world in which we live in. We are the strangers. This is where he's planted us right now. And God, I want your glory to be shown through me here. I don't know how, but I will trust in you. So this is, uh, again, uh, and God is using the, the imagery of, of trees. Now, 
how are trees used in the Bible? Because I'm just picking like one verse here in Isaiah 41. But this isn't the only place trees are found in the Bible. You know, where else do we find trees and their importance? Yeah, the cedars of, of Lebanon. And uh, God used the cedars of Lebanon for like the construction of the, the temple. And God is saying, you are going to be my, my people where my glory is revealed. So, at, so you remember that when like Solomon's temple was built and it was dedicated by Solomon, that the glory of the Lord filled the temple. But now the temple is going to be destroyed. And God is saying, but you're going to be my cedars in the wilderness. So it, and you're like, there, there's no, how, how can this be? Well, it, God is sovereign. He is doing something new. This is a, a creation of his. Any other trees in the Bible? John? Um, he did see people like trees. I don't know if that's... Um, that would actually tie in with Isaiah 35, which is another wilderness passage, and the blind being given sight. Um, so that, that would be another way in which uh, life is given in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Any other trees? The garden. Yeah, the trees. The, the tree of life. That's how the Bible ends. Any other trees? The cross. The cross. And, and that would be the last place you expect to see the glory of God because according to the law of God, he who is hanged from a tree is accursed by God. In fact, according to the law, if a person was hanged on a tree, you weren't to leave them overnight. Otherwise, God would pronounce a curse on the whole land. And that's... The, so you, you, the most God-forsaken place is where you're going to find life and life everlasting. And, and Isaiah will bring us there eventually in Isaiah chapter 53. Um, and then in Isaiah 54, right after that, the barren woman shouts for joy because the barren woman's going to have more children than anyone else before her. So th this is, this is the, the sovereign work uh, of God. Um, another, another example of um, the botany, here's another acacia tree. Um, I think I forgot to put the cedar on here. I, that's what happened at home. All right, so I, I apologize. I, I uh, forgot to, to change the slides after this. Um, acacia trees were also, Mike mentioned the cedars being used in the temple. Acacia tree wood was used in the furnishing of the tabernacle where God's glory was also revealed. So the, um, for example, the Ark of the Covenant was made out of acacia wood and it was overlaid with gold. And so God, again, is planting his people as um, uh, in the, the worst of places, but that's where his glory would be manifested. Here's uh, um, the myrtle. Now, it's very hard to identify all of the trees here. There are a lot of different kinds of cedars and acacias. So this is to the best of my ability. Um, I've never been able to do this before, and I'm, I, I kind of, I like biology and things like that, so I was like, you know what, I, this is where my mind has been for a, a while now, and I want to, I want to just look at these seven trees as best as I can um, today, and, and so I spent my time, you know, looking at the, the hadas, like the myrtle, and so um, this does seem to be the, a flower from the myrtle, um, and, uh, uh, you know, I pointed out, you know, this is where the hadas or um, Esther was named after her Hebrew name. Um, the myrtle was also used by the Jews for the Feast of Booths, uh, as they remembered their period of wilderness wandering and the Lord providing. That, that was the whole Feast of Booths, uh, how God provided for them then. And in the days of Nehemiah, when they celebrated the, the Feast of Booths, they would also gather different kinds of wood, including uh, that from the myrtle to, to build um, their shelters. And um, again, as you begin thinking of these, uh, these images, um, it, this is reminding us, of course, of, of Psalm 1 uh, and the blessed man. In um, Isaiah chapter 55, here's another uh, passage where the myrtle is used. So Isaiah 55, we uh, quote often uh, that God's word doesn't return to him empty. It always accomplishes what he desires and achieves the purpose for which he sent it. 
But then Isaiah 55 goes on to say, For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up, and instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up, and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. So there's the power of God's word. There's the power of God's word in the the recreative act. And instead of the, the thorns and thistles of the curse in Genesis 3, now you are having, um, well, cypress coming up and myrtles. And so you have this judgment of Babylon. But God is saying in that judgment, and of course this takes us to the cross, but in, in that judgment, I will bring forth a new life. And, but, but it's you that's the new life. It's, it's God's people that are being born again by the power of of his word. So his, his word brings life in desert places. Um, here's the olive tree. Um, <clears throat> this would be a, a small to a medium sized tree. Um, and, and again, these are all trees. Um, and, and again, uh, it's, it interests me because Isaiah names seven trees that are uh, particularly well suited and adapted for uh, places without water. Uh, the, the root systems, like the, the root system of the Teneri tree, goes down over 100 feet. Um, some trees, like the olive tree, the, the leaves also, um, God made them in, in such a way um, that the, the leaves pres uh, conserve water. And uh, some of these trees, they, they're also able to uh, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere so they can live in soil that is very uh, nitrogen poor. They're, they're able to make uh, these things for themselves. So here's the, uh, an example of, again, in the wilderness, right, you, you see this, and I, uh, as I was doing this, I remembered um, one of the pictures Ben sent from South Sudan of trees. So, you know, if you, you have these huge trees, and, and people will gather under them. And I, I think the monkeys were uh, swinging around in one of the trees that, uh, one of those pictures. And again, um, I want to just, since we're talking about trees, and I, um, <clears throat> a quick biology lesson here, because uh, Isaiah 41 verse 20 mentions creation. So here, here's an olive tree. An olive tree is an angiosperm. Um, and an angiosperm is uh, like a, a flowering plant or tree, and one uh, that would produce fruit. And <clears throat> there are more than 200,000 species of angiosperms, um, flowering plants uh, like this. And um, the reason I bring this up um, is because uh, Charles Darwin called the angiosperms, and there are more than 200,000 of them. Here's one of them. He called them an abominable mystery. These are abom abominable mysteries because they appear suddenly in the fossil record out of like out of nowhere <laughs> and and so he write he wrote why isn't there a gradual evolution of angiosperms why can't we see immediate forms between the gymnosperms things like coniferms and the flower, flowering pants um, plants so to this day uh, you know more than 150 years later uh, angiosperms challenged the idea that life gradually evolved now, of course, we know that it was on day three of creation. You know, God said, let there be. And he created the, uh, the plants yielding seed and, and fruit. And, and what, we're, what God is saying through Isaiah here is that just as I, cr I created, right, the bara, there's that word bara, just as I created all of these trees on day three, um, I, I will make a new creation in a paradise um, and at a, a redemptive work through this, this exile. It, it, it's a supernatural work of God. And, and, and trees are still, you know, all ar around us. And this is how we need to be thinking of ourselves in, in the Lord. So we in Christ are rooted in him through faith. And we are to be fruitful. And, and this is, uh, you know, the, think of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. There's another image of, of fruitfulness. Uh, but the things like the love and the joy, the peace... Uh, it's the power of the age to come. So it's, it's to, to know and other people see, you know, the Lord, the Holy One has created it. 
And I, I hope that you can look at your life and see a change that God has brought about, a difference that he has brought about. And you look at it and say, oh, only God could have done this. Now, he's not finished with us, right? He's begun a good work. But we should be able to look at our, our lives and, and hopefully others and say, only, only God could have done this. I, there's no way I could have. And, and by God's grace, when other people are brought to desert places in their lives and they have nothing, you can say, you know, <laughs> but for the grace of God, I would be there. But for the grace of God, you through faith in Christ can have new life. He can take that, that, that death, that dust, that ever, the, the destruction, the wilderness, that, and, that, and he can make it new. And he's, how does he, I don't know. How did God create the angiosperms? <laughs> 200,000 that we know of, you know, just like that. Not to mention all the bees that pollinate them. And it, it, it's amazing. And, 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 and that's, that's what regeneration is. It's instantaneous, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a faith in Christ. And, and you're born again. You're born from above. And, and God is saying to his people is that in need of, of comfort and strength, this is, what I will do. And it's not just for your benefit. It's for the benefit of the nations. They, they need this message. The Babylonians need this just as much as you do. The coastlands need this just as much as you do. Um, so it's a, it's a very amazing and beautiful picture. Any comments or questions so far as we'll be moving on to uh, my best understanding of what the juniper is? All right, here's the juniper. And um, uh, so again, verse 49, I will put the cedar in the wilderness, the acacia and the myrtle, the olive tree. I will place the juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress. Um, I don't think anyone's certain what the juniper is. Um, in fact, the same Hebrew word that's used for juniper here is used in Isaiah 55, verse 13, and it's translated as cypress. <laughs> so that doesn't, that doesn't help us uh, very much. Uh, but here's a picture of a juniper tree from uh, the Jordan, from Jordan, and um, the 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 juniper wood was also used um, in the the temple, and and you might remember I don't have time uh, this evening, but you might remember that the tabernacle and the temple, and I think John prayed this in his prayer. They have images of Eden that were woven into the curtain and all around them. It was kind of like a, a paradise. Some some people have proposed that even the um, uh, the, the lampstand uh, was a kind of representation of the tree of life. That's that's possible. But you have those those images for sure in both the tabernacle and the temple. Now, in, in Isaiah's day, what he's saying is that with the Babylonian captivity, all of this is going is going. It's gone. It's going to be taken into Babylon. Uh, it will even be used for pagan purposes. Uh, in uh, w when Babylon fell, uh, some of the, the holy vessels of, of the Lord. But God is saying again, uh, you are m these trees. That the, My glory will be, the fruitfulness of the gospel will be through you. Um, it's possible in 1 Kings 19 also that this is the kind of tree that uh, Elijah sat under when fleeing from uh, Jezebel. So 1 Kings 19 verses 5 through 8 says that he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a, a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Uh, so there's, again, this is a passage of strength, and we looked at the emphasis on strength in Isaiah 41, and God is saying, just as I've strengthened my people throughout, uh, you can do everything, you know, we can do everything through him who gives us strength. So, uh, again, these are God, what God has done for his people in the past, he will do for us today. Uh, there's a supernatural beauty um, to a, a root system that goes down deep and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and the hardest and the harshest of, of circumstances. Any comments or questions as we look at next, my understanding of the box tree? All right, we come to uh, the box tree, and uh, this is the sixth of the trees. This is another tree, again, that's hard to identify. So in the New American Standard, there is a, a, 
a translation done in 1995. And that uh, translates it as box tree. That's the one I usually use as the NASB 95. In 2020, the New American Standard came out with a new, uh, a new updated version, and they translate it as elm tree. So they've changed the translation in the last 25 years. Um, that now, the, the box tree or the elm tree, um, so this may be what it looks like. It's, it's hard to say. Um, but it, you also f it's also mentioned one other time in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 13. So again, it's, it's only Isaiah, and which makes me wonder why is Isaiah so interested in all of these uh, desert wilderness plants, uh, which makes me think he's kind of like a Solomon. Solomon also studied um, a lot of creation, including trees and, and things like that, and Isaiah seems to have a, a huge affinity for that. Um, so let's see. I think um, the box tree or the elm tree, uh, I put box tree on this slide. I should have actually put... Um, there are three proposals for it. This, it could be like a, a terebinth tree. So uh, I'm going to say that the picture here is of a terebinth tree. So I, I'll have to fix that uh, for the future in my future thinking about trees. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, uh, as a, a cypress tree, this is the seventh of the trees uh, mentioned. And again, this is, I think, only mentioned in Isaiah. Um, and... Um, some people think that this is the cypress is the type of wood that y uh, Noah used in constructing the ark. So you've probably heard of the gopher wood, and, um, but it, that's an uncertain translation. It could have been uh, cypress wood. Um, so those are the, uh, the seven trees. And, and what Isaiah, again, is saying in verse 20, then after uh, all of the, the seven trees, uh, so the wonder of a tree in the wilderness living um, with poor soil, no water, no visible water anyway, uh, that they may see and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. So this, this is a new creation. God finished the work of creation in Genesis 2. He rested, but now he's creating something new, and uh, it's through his, his redeemed and saved people. Any comments or questions uh, as we look now and, and tie this into? Uh, so y y you would think that you would be most spiritually prosperous if your whole life is in order and, and everything is just peaceable and calm. Uh, and the fact of the matter is it's, it's usually the opposite. It's usually the, the, the real difficulties and hardships. The things that we will avoid sometimes, even at the cost of God's word, Right, so there, there are times in which we'll say, you know, I'm not going to the wilderness. I would rather break the word of God than go there. But it's actually as you're in, and, and sometimes you don't have a choice. So when, when God took, sent the Babylonians, nobody had a choice. You're just going. Sometimes we have this choice, and we're, and we're like, you know, between God's word, um, the grass withers, the flowers fade, the, with the word of our God stands forever, and uh, ex or, you know, difficulty, I'd rather choose maybe not doing God's word. But the, the fact and what Isaiah is saying and revealing is that, that following and obeying God's word and trusting God in his word, that's, that's where you're going to see the salvation of God. Um, and, and those circumstances of your life that are absolutely impossible, and it seems that God is pleased then to show, here's my right hand to save, so that you know that his salvation is, is not of for any other reason. This is what Paul talks about in, in 1 Corinthians in the preaching. I preach Christ, but I didn't come to you with, you know, the, the rhetoric of the world or anything else. I came to you in much weakness and trembling. And, and it's there in that preaching of the power of the word of God that you were saved. So that, and God did this so that your salvation, you couldn't say, you know, the reason I believe is Paul is just a really persuasive speaker. And there are a lot of very persuasive speakers out there. There are uh, persuasive speakers that could get you to go onto the battlefield and give your life. You know, they, they, they'll give you the charge and things like, but, but the, the, the gospel isn't something that's natural in that way. It's the word of God, and God will bring to, the, and where you hopefully can look at your life and say, you know, it wasn't anything else but, but the sovereign work of God the Holy Spirit. And and that's, that's the glory and that's the beauty of, of the power of, of God's word. So that's, again, as a Reformed church, that's important for us 
that we're not, we're not trying to persuade people b- through other means. Like, you can get people to make decisions, and they, they, there's ways of manipulating people. But, but that's, that's a counterfeit to the, the divine sovereign work of God and the Holy Spirit and his word. We don't want any counterfeits. We, we, we want people to say, you know, I, I don't know, I was hearing the word of God, and I, I came to life. I, I, God awakened me. He, he used his word in a, a mighty way. Um, but we don't want our salvation to rest on other things or people or uh, ways we can, we can manipulate. All right, so this is, uh, any comments or questions? I do want to, I want to tie this into some of the things that we've covered now because this is, this is so different from the beginning of Isaiah. Th- this is so help- hopeful. And, and the, reas- the reason I find encouragement is, you know, yeah, we're all, we're all in or we'll be going through dark places. We don't know what that valley of shadow of death will look like. But God is with us, and we don't need to fear any evil. Um, and it's in those places that God will work um, amazingly, um, above and beyond what we could ever ask for or imagine. All right, that's the context of Babylon. I want to bring it back to the promised land um, in the beginning of Isaiah. Uh, any comments or questions? I know my wife is watching at home and she's probably raising her hand right now, but I can't see you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> She'll get me on the phone. All right, that's good. All right, so let, let think back to how Isaiah began. All right, now this is in the promised land. Uh, your land is desolate. This is the promised land. Now I thought Babylon was desolate. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers, are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard. So this is another image, a plant-like image, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. Unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. In Isaiah 5, you have a parable, a song of the vineyard. Right, so Isaiah is the sweet singer of Israel and uh, let me sing now for my belo- well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. Now that's in the land flowing with milk and honey. Now Isaiah is prophesying that in Babylon, it will be productive, fruitful, and a blessing to the nations. That's what I'm saying is that unexpectedly, the most, I think, the most evangelistically profitable, fruitful time in a 70-year period of Israel's history was Babylon. So you, you can take any 70-year period before that, and you're worthless grapes. You, you can't, you don't taste good, you can't produce any kind of new wine or nothing. And, and so you, you would have thought that the most productive place would be Israel, the land. And God says, mm, it didn't work that way. And so when I exile you, I'll do a great work um, that you haven't seen before. Um, Isaiah 6, the throne room of God. Um, after Isaiah's commissioned, the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. So there will be a remnant, and there will be a judgment of this oak, this tree, this terebinth, and, uh, but there will be uh, roots, uh, a shoot of Jesse that will come forward from that. So you're beginning to see the first fruits of that in Babylon, and, and of course anticipating uh, the coming of Messiah. Um, Isaiah 27, the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. So not just Babylon, like the whole world. That's, that's us, and that's, that's what we have been uh, called uh, to do. And as I mentioned before, this goes back to Isaiah 53. Um, uh, you know, who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, 
nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So there's this God forsaken as he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. And then after Messiah's work, out is chapter 54. Remember that chapter divisions are artificial. Verse 1, shout for joy, O barren one. You have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud. You have not travailed, for the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. So here's that, that sovereignty of God of bringing life and out of death, life out of barrenness, uh, hope to the, the hopeless. And of course, this is I, I, throughout the scriptures, but think of how the Psalter begins. Um, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So wherever you're at in life, whatever the wilderness, the valley is, um, if you're planted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, you can know. You don't know how it's going to work out. That's, that's true. It, but you can know with absolute certainty that God is working all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And uh, he has given us the gift of angiosperms, trees all around, 200,000 different species of them. And, uh, and, and you, you look at that, hopefully you see Christ, that the mystery of the cross and his being nailed to the tree. Um, and uh, that through his death and resurrection, that all have, have new life in him. And uh, he, he is able to bring forth from that death and that exile um, what seems like nothing but thorns and thistles. He is able to, to bring forth uh, beauty and splendor. So any other comments or questions before we close in prayer? There's a... <coughs> All right, well, let's pray.